we'll get started in just a minute as uh, people are entering. So just hold on a, a minute or two. Okay, I'm going to start with some um, housekeeping things while folks enter the room. I'm Chrissy Giuliano, the Executive Director of the Big Cities Health Coalition. Uh, BCHC is a forum for the leaders of America's largest metropolitan health departments to exchange strategies and jointly address issues to promote and protect the health and safety of the nearly 62 million people they serve. Uh, you can see our, our member cities and, and county jurisdictions up there. Thanks everyone uh, for joining us today. We're so pleased to be able to have uh, this discussion. So this session is being recorded. Um, all the lines are muted except for our speakers. You can use um, the raise your hand feature or chat Gabrielle Nichols in the chat if you have any technical difficulties. Um, and you can also share any questions in the chat that we'll get to in a little bit. Um, so it's my pleasure to have with us today, Mashika Roberts from the city of Columbus and Marcy Flanagan uh, from Maricopa County, Arizona. So Mashika is the health commissioner again for the city of Columbus. Prior to her appointment as commissioner in December, 2017, she was the medical director and assistant health director the assistant health commissioner. Uh, she's also our BCHC vice chair. Early in her career, she served as an epidemiological intelligence service officer and as medical director for the Baltimore City Health Department. She earned her MD from the University of Maryland School of Medicine and her MPH from the University of Michigan, which I'm sure is very difficult for her living in Columbus, but anyway. Um, Marcy Flanagan is the Public Health Director in Maricopa County, Arizona, which encompasses the city of Phoenix, among others. Among her duties as Health Director, she's responsible for setting public health policy and responding to public health emergencies, among many other things. Marcy previously served as the Director of Pima County Department of Public Health and is currently the President of the Arizona Association of Local Health Officers. She has a degree in sociology from the University of Arizona, a master's in administration and in public health and a doctorate in business administration. So thank you both um, so much for being here today. We know um, you're so busy and we really appreciate you sharing your time with all of us. Um, so before we sort of dig into the current situation um, that's going on, let's think back a little bit to the early part of the COVID-19 outbreak. So in February and March, we weren't necessarily hearing as much about Arizona and Ohio, though I know Marcy, you had a, a case early on. Um, so thinking about that, what did you do in those days to prepare for you know, sort of the surge that you've seen most recently? And what did you learn from observing um, what was going on in other cities or states? Um, Marcy, why don't we start with you? Sure, so for us, uh really seeing those early outbreaks in the long-term care facilities, we started ramping up early, getting our uh, staff and, and getting some more contractors on board that could provide some infection control uh, recommendations and guidance to those long-term care facilities, and also tried to start figuring out how we could limit um, the staff that we know works between multiple facilities, um, where we already were seeing small you know, numbers pop up. Um, but early on, we, you know, were ramping up all of our uh, contact tracing and all those things that you do anytime that you start having um, early on emergency, uh, emergence of a communicable disease. So all of that really helped us. And then just communicating with those health officers and um, directors of those cities 
to see if we could offer assistance, but also learn from them and, and take any recommendations that they gave. Great, and Sheikha? So um, we too were watching and learning from other cities, whether it be New York and Washington. Um, we started organizing ourselves here in late January. We went into an incident command structure. Uh, we were updating, I was updating my mayor on a weekly basis of what I knew about the virus and where it was circulating. Uh, we had testing available at that time only through our state. Um, so we had a few cases that our hospitals were sending to the state lab for testing and none of them came back positively, fortunately. But what was really on our horizon is we were working with a group that was planning the Arnold Festival. And the Arnold is an international event that happens every March here in Columbus, Ohio. And they bring in close to 20 to 30,000 people from across the world um, to compete, but also people come just to see, to sightsee, to see the sites and to go through their expo center. So we had been working with those organizers and the medical leads for them about what they were going to do to control travelers or um, um, sports, um, their, their sporting event spectators, as well as the participants coming from the countries at that time that had high levels of cases like China, like Italy. Um, and so we've been working with them closely. And um, they had a plan that I thought was okay, but it wasn't the best. And as things in, got more and more intense, I got more and more concerns about what their plans were like. And so I literally woke up on a Monday morning. The, the expo was scheduled to start that Thursday. And I literally woke up that Monday morning and I said, I don't feel good about this. I don't think this event should happen. And um, I told my staff and my staff almost fell out of their chair. They're like, there's no way you can cancel that event. You know, it's a huge um, income stream for the city and the state. Um, long story short, I called my mayor, I called others and um, I called the director at the state health department. And by um, Tuesday, there was a decision that the governor had decided that they weren't gonna allow the Arnold to take place. So that was really what got everyone here in Columbus to stand up and open their eyes and realize that COVID-19 was serious. Um, but at that time, the state didn't have the capacity to test. We were sending all of our samples to CDC through our state lab. And so myself and the state health director were really concerned that if we had cases here as a result of this event, we would not be able to get individuals tested appropriately. So let's sort of come back now to the present. Um, you know, you've both seen different curves over the last couple months, um, you know, in the cases and, and unfortunately deaths. Um, Marcy, we've heard a lot about Arizona in the media. Um, so tell us a little bit about, you know, what you've seen over the past two months or so. Um, where you see the your current outbreaks going and, and what's sort of challenge you, challenging you the most these days? Uh, so I can start. Uh, really, what we've seen the past couple months, we saw our huge spike uh, in mid-June and we were seeing upwards of 3,000 cases a day. So, um, uh, you know, I, I don't know how many epidemiology staff that, um, you know, everyone thinks is available in the US, but there's hardly an amount that you could, you could have trying to track, trace, um, isolate, quarantine when there's 3,000 cases a day coming in just, you know, daily. So when we were seeing that, it was really um, exactly the timeline that we expected. Two weeks after the governor lifted the stay at home order, those numbers exploded and we were scrambling. We had already, prior to that, we were seeing just around 100 cases a day, 200 cases a day. So we were ramping up, hiring, training, getting contracts and board, getting everything on place to be able to do about 600 case investigations a day. And when we hit 3,000, obviously uh, 500, 600 is nowhere close to 3,000. So our staff was drowning. Um, and, and we were in that state for a few weeks before the, the governor really um, allowed the local governments to start taking action. And one of those, it was just one thing we were allowed to take action on, which was the mask mandate. And within 24 hours of us having the authority to do that, we went before our board and really 
plead with them that this needed to be a countywide mandate. It didn't make sense for different cities within Maricopa County. Um, we have almost four and a half million people here in Maricopa County to have it just pop up in certain cities, the mask mandate. Um, people travel across the entire county on a daily basis. So it just doesn't make sense. So we pleaded with our board. They were a little reluctant, but in the end, they, they took our recommendations and they did a countywide mandate. Um, and as we would expect, uh, two weeks after that, the numbers started to slowly come down. And also what happened a week after the mask mandate, the governor came back out and closed down some of the businesses. He closed down bars, um, he closed down uh, gyms and movie theaters. And that's when we started to see our numbers increase. Unfortunately, because we had gone a couple weeks seeing that 3,000 cases a day, it had already overwhelmed our hospital system. So we, we kind of tell everybody it's, it's going to have this domino effect. We're going to see the cases rise, then we're going to see our hospitals affected, then we're going to see, unfortunately, our death count go up. And that's exactly what happened here. So in July, we had our medical examiner's office, who sees a very, very small portion of COVID cases. Those aren't the typical cases that make its way to a medical examiner. But our medical examiner was having a backlog and had um, upwards of 60 bodies that were ready to be picked up for final disposition that funeral homes were saying they did not have the capacity to pick them up. And, you know, we had to really take, peel back all the layers to see what was happening on the throughput, where was the barrier and, and what was holding things up. And it really turns out that um, it was several things. It was um, families that have been financially impacted, not having the resources for um, final disposition. It was um, a smaller proportion, but some families waiting, wanting to have a larger service for their loved one and um, hoping that if they waited a couple weeks or a month that they would finally um, get to that point. And you just had funeral homes overwhelmed. So we have put several things in place that have um, kind of mitigated some of those efforts and helped relieve it. But in that interim, we did have to order portable coolers. We ended up um, using those portable coolers and it wasn't um, a result of, because the medical examiner was overwhelmed with cases, it was the, these were bodies we put in uh, separate storage units, coolers um, that were waiting for final pickup from funeral homes. Um, the other thing we really discovered in our state is that funeral homes do not report their capacity um, to any state database or agency. So it literally took uh, hundreds of staff hours calling every single funeral home in our county to ask what their capacity was. Um, we heard from some that said, oh, we, we have room. You can, you know, send some to us. But then we had others like, no, we, we're stacking bodies. So um, we have asked for an executive order to be put in place, something similar to where hospitals have to report what their bed capacity is, that uh, funeral homes have to report their capacity to the state. That hasn't happened yet. So our fear is that um, really what we are getting ready for is just uh, yesterday I found out from the state that we are probably hitting the benchmarks because our numbers have come down um, significantly and we are really getting community spread under control that uh, by tomorrow they're going to allow these bars and gyms and movie theaters to start opening again. Um, and so we're scared. We're worried what that's gonna do. Um, in conjunction with that, we have all the schools trying to go back in session and a lot of pressure in this state for, um, which I, I get, um, to get students back in the classrooms. Um, but I think the culmination of all that happening at the same time, and you also have a lot of information, especially recently, uh, for whatever reason in the media, um, that wearing a mask isn't doing much. It's, you know, it, everyone's saying that, oh, we thought it was protecting you and the other people around you, but now it's only protecting the people around you. So there's been tons of pressure lately here in Arizona to lift the mask mandate. And it's not a statewide mandate. We have counties 
that have not put anything in place. And we are, Epi's did an analysis for me just last week. And, you know, for us, when we were at our peak of 3,000 cases to come halfway down from that peak, it took us 31 days after the mask mandate was in place. For counties that did not put a mask mandate in place, their average was 48 days. And so uh, it scares me that um, political pressures and other things may lead to, um, we've already kind of been warned by our board, they're getting a lot of pressure of when is this going to lift? And when we've given our public health recommendation and answer that we can't lift this mask mandate until we reach herd immunity, which means um, it's probably a combination of a vaccine and um, individuals who have been infected. And we're doing a, a zero survey starting um, just in two weeks uh, of the community to kind of see what, what the numbers look like to give us an idea of where we need to be with our vaccine, which one becomes available. But um, I, I think what we're preparing for and what we're worried about is what's gonna happen in the coming weeks with all these things starting to open again and um, fear that the mask mandate may be lifted. Yeah, so for us, you know, a slightly different picture. We, um, our first case here in Columbus was identified on March 13th. Um, it was actually Friday, March 13th when I got the call from the state health department and um, it was not a joke when they called and I was like, well, it is Friday the 13th, so let's roll with it. Um, and that next week, the governor put in a stay at home order across the state. So that helped everyone really and um, here in Columbus we saw a small peak that peak really hit us like the end of April beginning of May is when we saw a peak and for us a peak was about 114 cases per day that was the highest we got you know I know I'm looking at your face Marcy like really I could take that any day <laughs> um, and then the governor started opening the state back up um, probably mid-May he started opening things up and he had a very gradual opening, reopening plan. So not everything opened at once, which, you know, we appreciated. And then um, I would say by the 1st of June, almost everything was open. There were a few exceptions, but most things were open. And we didn't really start to see our second peak um, until late June is when we started to see our second peak probably around June 20th, 25th, we started to see our second peak. And then it just skyrocketed from there with a maximum of about 270 cases per day is where we got, that was our maximum. Um, but, you know, I unfortunately um, have a very supportive board, a very supportive mayor and a very supportive city council who every day as they watch the numbers go up, they kept calling me and saying, what else can we do? What do we need to do? So um, my mayor put forth a mask order on July 3rd, um, and that helped some, but we also saw a lot of people having July 4th celebrations. All of the um, organized fireworks throughout the county had been canceled this year as a result of COVID-19. So that was a good thing. Um, but um, initially it was kind of city by city who was taking on the mask order. Um, and so finally, the governor did put forth a statewide mask order. Initially, he put it um, county based based on how many cases you had per county, and then he made it statewide. And that has helped tremendously. We saw a significant decre decrease in cases about 14 days after our mayor put in the mask order. So that helped. Um, but that the, those cases stayed high for a while. Fortunately, we never saw any issues with our hospitals. Um, that's good. They always had capacity. Um, you probably heard in Ohio, we had a few prisons that had some large outbreaks of COVID-19. Fortunately for me, none of those were in my jurisdiction, but many of those patients ended up coming to hospitals in my jurisdiction. So my hospitals felt it, but never to the point where they were over capacity. Um, and then something that also helped us is the bars. Um, we were seeing a lot of um, inappropriate behavior at bars, um, people not practicing the social distancing. Obviously, it's very difficult to wear a bar when you're, to wear a mask when you're at a bar trying to drink. Um, and some of the bar owners got really upset. They said, you, you know, we feel like you're picking on us, even though the data is very clear. It's not the bar itself, it's the behavior that happens at the bar. So we tried to pass um, some rules um, to put bars to have them close or stop actually have them close. Our plan was to have them close at 11 p.m. 
and our city council passed that legislation and then we were taken to court and we got a restraining order and so that was put on hold um, but the governor heard it loud and clear. We had a visit from Dr. Burks. Um, he heard it from my mayor and others. And so he put a statewide order in place that alcohol has to, you have to stop selling alcohol at 10 p.m. every night and you have to ha be done consuming it by 11 p.m. every night. Um, the restaurants or bars don't have to close, but they can't sell and no one can consume alcohol after that. That has also helped. We've seen a decrease in um, cases, from, it's particularly in the age group of 20 to 29. That's where we saw the biggest increase in this second wave was in that age group. Um, so, you know, we have a statewide mask order in place now. We have a, um, uh, uh, I'll call it an earlier curfew on alcohol, so to speak. And so those two um, factors, I think, are really helping. But we do have some schools that are going back. Um, OSU, one of the largest universities in the country and definitely the largest in the state, started classes this week. I've been working very closely with them. They're trying to test all of their students, particularly those that live on campus, every single week. Um, and they're helping us by taking over the case and contact investigation on our behalf. They've hired more staff. So, you know, we have concerns moving forward, but we think we're in a good position right now if we can hold tight on the mask order and the alcohol sales. Great, thank you both. Um, so, you know, you both sit in, so Marcy, you run a county health department. Mashiki, you run a city health department. You, um, live in um, states where you have varying degrees of local control or not. Um, you know, and then there's also this idea of some conflicting federal guidance and response over the past six months. So can you talk a little bit how you navigate, you know, taking care of your community when you have um, constraints from the state and or, you know, confusion in sort of the national, the national mood around all this. I don't know who wants to go first. Sure, I'll go first. Um, so, you know, as I said before, I think we have a very supportive governor who has um, done what is best for the residents of Ohio and the health and safety of the residents in Ohio and really tried to put the political stuff to the side. Um, and so I commend him on that. Um, our governor is a Republican, my mayor is a Democrat, and um, really since the days of Arnold, when we were making those decisions, um, they've been aligned, um, and their priority is the health and safety of the residents of their community. And so for that, I'm fortunate. Um, I'm also fortunate that I have a very supportive board um, of health, five members who were asking me all the time, I mean, they came to me with a mask order in June and said, how can we do a mask order? How can we do a mask order? And I said, you know, I was worried about the safety. I was worried about the implementation. Um, and, you know, it, it ended up coming and they were very, very happy that it came. But um, I have told everyone um, from a politician to the average community resident that science has to be the driving force and science is what's making my decisions. Um, a lot of people don't like my decisions. Um, even some of my peers and other health departments across the state don't understand why I'm making those decisions. Um, but I remind everyone that I have the largest county or the largest city in the state. Franklin County, where we sit, is the largest county in the state. And we have been leading the state pretty much since week two of this, out, or this pandemic here in Ohio with the number of cases. And so um, we have collectively in Franklin County, 20,000 cases, I think 21,000 cases. And I think the next county that has the highest is 16,000. And so I remind people of that all the time when they say, well, why can they do it here and they can't do it here? Well, we have 20,000 cases and they have 10,000 cases or whatever the case might be. So um, it's been challenging. I've never experienced this before in my public health career. You know, I've lived through Zika, I've lived through Ebola, I've lived through H1N1, and this is like no other. I mean, it's very, very different. And it's been frustrating at times that, you know, there is this um, disconnect between science and the policies that are being suggested. Uh, but I feel strongly that if I rely on science and the science is out there, 
that I'm doing the right thing for my department and for my community and for all the people who live here. Yeah, I would, I would just really echo that. I think what's been most important in my role is to stay focused and grounded in public health and science. Um, unfortunately, our mayors um, and governor have not been on the same page and it's been difficult. It's difficult because um, when the governor put in his executive order, um, part of that early on was that no local government could put anything in place, um, that all of that kind of authority went to him. The good thing is that we do have a good relationship with our state health department. We have, um, you know, twice a week, we're on the phone with them, with all health officers in Arizona and the state health department. So we've been able to give input and guidance, um, but it's been limited on what recommendations we can make to our board that they can actually take any action on because that authority has been um, taken at the state level. So that's been a little frustrating. Um, our board though would like to see the mask mandate happen at a statewide level, um, but there hasn't really been interest for that. I think there's too many um, you know, smaller counties that are just really, really against having anything in place. Um, partly, I, I get it, there are much less dense than, than we are and um, there's really just a handful of counties in Arizona that are what you would consider like a metropolis and, and very urban. The rest is very, you know, wild west, um, less dense, uh, less populous. So in Maricopa County, we've had um, over 130,000 cases and we're 60% of the state's population and we've seen more than 60% of the cases in um, Arizona. So much like uh, Mashika is describing, we've really been leading this um, since very early on uh, because we were the first county with a case um, and we were, I think the second and third cases came all from our county. So uh, we've really been in partnership with the state making some of those uh, guidelines and recommendations, but it's, it's not always easy um, to, to kind of be in the, the position we're in, which is um, really making sure that we're leading with public health. And we are, we've had, and, and it's not just from one side of the aisle, we've had um, people be upset with us. And, and that's, and, you know, I've lived through all those same uh, public health uh, pandemics and epidemics and this is very unique. And um, I think it does not help that it is an election year. And so unfortunately, I think politics have started to swirl in a uh, public health world that we, our staff, especially our epidemiologists, we're just used to really doing public health. And so they don't understand when something makes public health sense and, and follows the science, why uh, we're being questioned on it. So that's new and it puts additional pressure on everybody. And, and I think we've seen the result of that, which is um, unfortunately a mass exodus of health officers around the country. Now, if I could just piggyback on something Marcy said about, you know, different um, situations in different counties within the state, you know, we have that here in Ohio, just like any other state. And one thing our governor did that I really applaud him on is he put, um, he put out a public health advisory system and he has basically graded each state and there's three levels, level one through four, each county, I'm sorry, each county level one through four, four being the worst, and they're color coded. So it goes from yellow, orange, red, and purple. And so when you are a higher level county, like a red or a purple, you can justify the actions and the, um, the mitigation efforts that are taking place there versus a lower level county. Um, although the mask order is statewide, um, but it, it has helped because there are many counties that, you know, don't have very many cases at all, and they don't understand why they're being treated like the other counties, um, the, you know, the metro areas that have a large number of cases. So that it has really helped. Um, Franklin County has been red since the beginning. Um, no county has been purple, but the first time he um, laid out the plan, we were on the watch list to be purple. Um, but fortunately, we never made it to purple, and now we're hopefully going to turn to orange here in the next day or so. Um, but they look at seven different metrics and to determine, 
you know, what your level is. And I think that's really helped, um, particularly those um, really rural counties who didn't want to be in the same boat as the larger metro areas. And I know in some places like Texas, where they've been a little more constrained in their local authorities, they've used those color coding systems to be able to say directly to the public, we can't mandate this, but look at where we are, you as an individual in your community need to, you know, think about what you're doing to, you know, contribute to the, the health of the population. Mm -hmm. Um, so Marcy, I know that I've noticed on your website that you all have a dashboard of metrics about opening um, K to 12 schools. Now, um, I live at, right outside of DC in Maryland. Our schools are online until January and a lot of people want to know what the metrics are and we don't have any. So can you tell us a little bit about what metrics you're looking at, um, particularly for the, the K 12 schools? Yeah, so similar to um, a lot of the other things, the metrics were um, released at a state level. So it was something that the state health department released. We had formed a work group um, earlier on with our um, several school superintendents, school administrators, the nurses association, medical association, and university partners uh, to, in the summer to kind of walk through. We knew fall was approaching. We knew everybody would be asking what's going to happen when the school season starts. And here in Arizona, there are several school districts and schools that start in mid-July. Um, they have a, in, in their what they call kind of year-round school. So school really goes through July through uh, late May. And then there's only about six weeks off. And then they're right back in school again. So those schools in July were looking for answers that... Um, we, we were similar to what you're describing. We didn't have anything in place um, because we were just in the height of dealing with our numbers. Um, we, we didn't really take that time to think about schools yet. So um, with our, our kind of work group that we had at our county, we started walking through what would be important for schools to know when they came back. Um, and then the state released the three benchmarks that they are using to determine that. And they're going on similar to, you know, stoplight red, yellow, green, um, whether they're, um, what the spread looks like, if it's minimal, moderate, or severe. And when you're, it's severe and in red, um, you are limited to just strictly virtual learning. Um, and then when you're in moderate, the yellow, it's a hybrid model, which is um, part virtual, part in person. And then green is fully bringing everybody back to class. Um, those were put in place just a few weeks ago, and it was really with the intent that even if we ever hit green, which I, I just don't foresee happening before a vaccine is available, um, you would still need masks and some social distancing um, requirements in place. But really what our dashboard does is the state dashboard was releasing these uh, benchmarks and metrics by county. And because we are such a large county and because we're so diverse in what exists within our county, um, our school superintendent said loud and clear, we can't go just by the county data. Um, so the three benchmarks are, they're looking at the uh, rate of positivity and looking for that to be below 5% um, for uh, it to hit green. And uh, their state identified uh, six through 9% uh, or 10% to be moderate and then anything above that in the red. So, um, we're mixed bag in Maricopa County when you break that down. So our dashboard breaks down all of the benchmarks um, by school district, zip code, and city, uh, because we have some school districts that um, have open enrollment. And so um, students move between, it's not, doesn't always make sense to look at an entire school district. Um, we have others that serve multiple zip codes. So they wanted it by zip code. And then we have some that, um, are within cities but cross city lines so we thought we would give the data as much as uh, we could on all of those and so um, they can click on a zip code a school district or a city and they'll see all the benchmarks so the first one is that positivity rate um, the second is cases per 100,000 and then the third is COVID like illnesses in hospitals so it'll show where you are on each of those um, benchmarks and metrics and whether you fall in the red, yellow, or green. And right now we had one, and, and again in Arizona, what 
what happened at the state level was that ADE came out with these um, in conjunction with the Department of Health, the Department of Ed, um, but the, the decision lies at the local level again. So it's up to school boards to determine if they're gonna follow those or if they're just gonna bring students back. And we have a school district that brought students back and we're already have cases and they've been back a week. Um, so we already have uh, over 30 students. We are put at um, home isolation because they were exposed to a positive case. Uh, so it's happening, it's, it's there. And um, we're just trying to give the schools the best information and, and resources and data that we can as possible to make the best decisions moving forward. But we have the opposite end of schools that say until there's a vaccine, parents should plan on their students learning virtually. Mishiga, how are you all handling K-12 openings? So, you know, the governor came out um, and said schools should reopen if they can. Um, he said that sometime in July and has continued to reinforce that. And um, right after the July 4th holiday, when I saw the numbers increasing here in Franklin County, I got very concerned. And I um, told the schools drafted recommendations that they should not bring kids back into the classroom face to face until we had seen four consecutive weeks of a downward trend in cases. So many schools were not happy with that. Um, I only have two large public school districts in my city, but a lot of the surrounding suburbs, those school districts were looking at my guidance as well. And so um, it took five weeks to get to four consecutive weeks. And so we just hit that mark this week. And I just shared that with them. But, um, you know, other health departments really around the state have just been saying, you know, let's talk about your plans. They haven't really given them that kind of criteria or guidance of when to reopen. You know, and I've been clear with my superintendents, like, I want the kids to go back to the classroom. I realize there are many, many benefits for them being at school. Um, but I also want them to be safe and I want their staff to be safe. This is not just about the kids, it's about the staff. Um, and since, you know, I made the recommendation about a downward trend in cases, the governor has now come out and said that all, everyone in a school building has to wear a mask. At one point it was just the staff and not the kids. So now he's saying everyone has to wear a mask. And so I think those will help, but we do have some schools that have started, um, mostly our private schools, and we've got a few cases. And so our largest school district here in the city they chose to wait and not do face-to-face -face and do virtual for the first quarter. So they're not planning to at least entertain the idea of coming back face-to-face -face until sometime in October. But I've, I've also told my schools, like, I can't guarantee what October is gonna look like or November or December. Right now, there's a window. And if you can, utilize that window. Get in, get those kids into the classroom, have them meet the teachers. I don't know how long it's gonna last. I really don't know. I don't have a crystal ball. Um, so that's been challenging. That's probably where I personally got most of my hate mail from, from the parents when I said that. And then I also said, if you can't be in school, you can't have sports or you shouldn't have sports. Again, it was a recommendation, but I mean, my email box was flooded with emails of parents saying, how dare you take away our kids' sports? But again, if it's not safe enough for them to be in the classroom to learn, how can it be safe enough for them to be on any sporting field without a mask, right. you know, playing some activity or sport that they love, but they're not protected? Yeah, so our schools, as I said, are virtual, and my son is playing Little League, and they're all masked, except when they're in the outfield. But uh -huh. I, I test, this is like the whole world on this webinar doesn't need to hear this, but... Um, <laughs> I tasked my husband with going to the first practice to uh -huh. engage the mask situation because I was like, I don't want to be the public health mom who, you know, pulls my <laughs> Anyway, but we digress. Um, so let's talk a little bit about um, your staff or the staff of your health departments. Um, you know, we've heard and, and we've all talked about this, but, you know, for, for folks who weren't part of those conversations, you know, we've heard a lot about the mental health implications, um, particularly of health care workers on, you know, on the in the media. Um, but obviously your teams have also been working 24 seven, possibly for longer right before hospitals saw the surge. Um, 
So tell us a little bit sort of what you've been seeing and hearing um, from your staff and, and what you do to try to support your workforce. Again, knowing that this is not going to be over tomorrow, but that there's a pretty you know, long horizon for, for everybody to be doing this work 24 seven. Yeah, for us, um, we were fortunate when we got our CARES Act funding that our board was supportive of especially our staff that we had staff um, early on. And then when we hit our numbers in June, that we're working nonstop, that we're working seven days a week, 12, 15 hour days. And, and not because I was standing over them, making them be there. It's, that's what public health staff do. They're very passionate and dedicated about the work that we do. And they get very close with the individuals they're working with on cases. Um, they have family members really open up to them about um, their loved ones that are in the hospital or are in quarantine that they're worried about. And so they felt obligated to continue to come in and do the work that they're doing. So, um, you know, money is only good <laughs> when you can actually do something and enjoy it. Um, when you're working nonstop and, and it's great that, you know, the money's maybe accumulating in a bank account, um, but you actually can't afford to take the time off because we've seen such a drastic drop in our numbers. Now I've been working really hard to try to get some folks to take some time off. Um, just got our chief medical officer to take two weeks off. I'm so excited for her to um, just go and be at a place that she can't connect with, um, you know, and that was important to me to get her somewhere. So she drove 26 hours to uh, her second home in Oregon, which is kind of in the middle of nowhere on a river. And I said, please, you know, we need this. And so I constantly am encouraging my staff to find things where they can center themselves, where they can um, really just recognize the signs and symptoms of um, stress and depression and all of those. We've done little things. We've brought in dog therapy. We've had um, dogs come through and visit our epi team and, and our call center and those sorts of things and just kind of visit with the staff. Um, our board was really supportive from the beginning of the outbreak. They brought in um, all uh, lunches were catered um, and, you know, nothing extravagant and expensive, but because we had staff that just weren't leaving and restaurants and things were closed down, um, that, was, that was a nice um, gesture that happened. One of our uh, supervisors, board of supervisors, actually his family farm owns a huge um, egg farm. And early on in the pet, there was a shortage of eggs and everything else and toilet paper, all of those things. So we had board members that were going in and buying those supplies and bringing them to our unified command um, for staff. And so any of those things, we've just tried to really um, thank our staff because as you point out, Chrissy, I have a sister who's a nursing director at a very large hospital system here in Phoenix. And, um, she kind of said to me, like, I feel bad. It's all about the healthcare workers in the hospitals. And I know what you and your team are doing in public health. And I feel bad. And, and that gets to our staff sometimes. I think working in public health for 20 years, like I have, I've gotten used to people don't really understand the difference between public health and, and direct health care. And so I've gotten a little used to that. But it's hard when we're bringing on new staff and hiring people and asking our staff to um, really be dedicated to the cause and and um, it's difficult. So we try to find as many ways as possible as thanking them and appreciating them and recognizing the efforts they're doing. Yeah, we've been challenged the same way. You know, we weren't able to hire staff. Um, we're still trying to hire more staff. Um, uh, we've been, like I said, in incident command since January. Uh, we've restructured our incident command a little bit so that we can have some time off but you know just like Marcy said in the beginning we were all working crazy hours and um, it, you know that has slowed down a lot with with better organization with more staff um, but I've had staff quit I've had staff cry I've had staff get upset um, I've had staff want hazard pay um, and but then I've had staff say you know I don't want overtime or you know that's not doing me any good because like Marcy said, you know, there's not a lot of places you can go and where you can use your money right now, you know. So um, this summer has helped. We've had a lot of people take vacations. And so I think that has helped. You know, we had one member who wanted to quit, took a 10-week 
vacation and came back and said, okay, I think I can do this. I don't need to quit. Um, but it's been challenging. We brought in lunches to, we've had our employee assistance program do um, meditation and stretching and different things with our staff. We've taught them, done classes and short workshops on conflict resolution, how to deal with clients when you call. You know, many of our staff who aren't used to doing these interviews and investigations were almost traumatized when they would call a case and find out the case had died, or when they talked to a family member who said, you know, my loved one who is positive is in the hospital and could be dying. They really didn't know how to handle that. And so we had to give them some coaching and training on that. But it's it's been more than a notion. And you know, for me, I also recognize that what I'm asking my staff to do at work is just one part of their life. You know, many of them are dealing with homeschooling, um, other issues, whether it's an elder patient, um, um, parent that they're trying to take care of. Maybe their spouse has lost their job or their hours got cut back. So now there's a financial strain on the family. And so I realize that just the pandemic and the work here is not the only thing they're dealing with. They're dealing with a lot of other challenges as well. So I try to be sensitive to that as well. Um, but you know, my staff got very frustrated, particularly early on when all the attention went to the healthcare providers and you know, first responders, which most people assume is police and fire. And they were like, well, what about us? You know, what are we doing? And sometimes it was frustrating when I would see, you know, local restaurants giving food to a hospital and saying, oh, thank you for all you're doing. And it's like, well, what about us? You know, um, what are we doing? And so um, same challenges. Um, we've tried some pick me up. I've tried to do rounds. I've tried to do WebExes with different small groups of my staff. Um, and we've got some other plans in place to motivate them and encourage them to think of things outside of COVID. And, and what about um, you all and other leaders of health departments, right? How are you trying to balance caring for your staff and, and yourselves? Yeah, I, I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> um, it's been hard. Um, I, you know, I pretty much worked nonstop from March until the second week of July when I tried to take a week off. Um, and that week off ended up being two days in the office and almost all of four days on email or some way, shape or form connected. So I didn't come back rested at all and my staff were really upset with me. They were frustrated with themselves too because they felt like they didn't do enough to support me and support that week off. Um, and so I learned quickly, like I can't do a whole week because that's just too long right now with everything going on. And so um, in August, I started taking Fridays off. So I was able to disconnect on a Friday and that, that has worked for me thus far that I can take a Friday off. Um, but, you know, I've got my first planned time coming up to take a real vacation and I'm excited, but I'm a little nervous too about, you know, how I, I, I think everything is going to be okay, but it is, it is hard. And, you know, I've, I've still tried to keep up with exercising. I'm still trying to make sure I, I eat well most days. Um, I tell my staff this all the time, and I don't know if you are familiar with this. It's not a diet. It's called an eating plan called Whole30, where you basically go gluten-free, sugar-free, dairy-free, grain-free for 30 days. And um, I had started that right at the beginning of March. <laughs> and my staff, and you can't have alcohol either. So my staff, you know, some of those early days are like, I just want to go home and have a drink. And I was like, I can't. I can't. And they were surprised that I was able to do it for 30 days at the beginning of the pandemic. But what I told everyone is it gave me structure. It gave me focus. And I could, I could control what I ate, but I couldn't control the other things. And so um, that, I think, really helped me because I've actually kind of continued it um, throughout the pandemic. I've been doing it like 80% of the time, not 100% of the time. And I am drinking alcohol now. I needed it. <laughs> Mercy. Uh, yeah, I would say it, it has been difficult. I think um, many health officers are in the same boat as us. It's hard to get away. Um, I actually had a couple of days off in March, very early on in the pandemic, and it hit the newspapers. Mm -hmm. And I got a lot of criticism and hate mail and call for my termination. 
And um, without going into too much detail, I lost a daughter last year and it was a memorial um, thing that we were doing that I was out of the office for. So to get that kind of reaction from the media and the community was really a lot. It was, a, you know, not only were my staff heartbroken and frustrated and angry, um, my supervisor was like, this is, this is not okay. So I think I've been a little gun shy <laughs> to take any time off since that happened. Um, but I, I am getting now my supervisor and county administration saying, you need to take a few days off. So um, I consider Fridays like a nice day for me because I actually go and work out of my office every other day I'm at the unified command which is at a whole different location and building and it's really hard to be away from my desk in my office so Fridays are nice for me they're kind of a more chill relax I get to disconnect a little from the pandemic and actually concentrate on my other job which is running the department still and, and doing all that other work so um, but I am looking and the coming weeks to take a few days off. But I agree, a full week, it, it's a lot to, to think about to be gone for. Um, okay, so um, as we wrap up, we're gonna try and, and um, end on a high note. Um, what gives you hope as you think about the next three, six months, year, whichever chunk of that you feel like you can be hopeful about, um, what, what would you sort of say to others as you're, as you're thinking about, again, the next three, six months, um, a year? I think for me, what gives me hope is knowing that um, I think we're going to see a vaccine um, in that time frame. Um, some are saying by the end of the year, I would be really amazed and excited if it's by the end of the year. I keep telling my staff early next year um, would, is maybe more realistic, but even that, um, it's really not that far away. You think we've been in this since January. It's been a long time already. And to think, you know, I keep telling everybody with this is, you know, if you want to think of it like a, a sporting event, we're like at halftime right now. Like we just, just half time's about over and, um, you know, we may see as things start to open our numbers go back up again, we can't let up on the efforts that we have in place and what we're doing. Um, but that there is a kind of a light at the end of the tunnel. And um, I think also with that is what keeps me going stuff is, is being able to connect with other health officers and, and um, share our experiences and really be a support network for one another. I would agree. Definitely knowing that there's a vaccine on the horizon um, gives me a lot of hope. Um, I'm optimistic that we'll get it sometime in the first quarter of next year. Um, but then, you know, the challenge that I remind my staff all the time is then you have to get it in people's arms. You know, it's one thing for the vaccine to be here, but it's a whole nother thing to get people to take the vaccine. And so, you know, we've already started to work on our plans of how we would distribute the vaccine, but we're also gonna to have to do a lot of communication of telling people um, why they should get the vaccine and why it's important. So, but that does give me a lot of hope. And, you know, I have to admit that my staff have been incredible, especially my leadership team. They've been incredible supportive through this whole process and being able to connect with, you know, as Marcy said, other health commissioners across the state across the country who tell me things like we got 3000 cases a day. I'm like, Oh, okay. I can rest easy with my 275 cases. Um, so those things just help put things in perspective at times. Um, and then to know that you're not alone, that other people are going through the same challenges that you are. And so the feelings you have, um, you shouldn't, you know, be embarrassed or concerned about your feelings. They're valid feelings because other in your same position are having those same feelings and concerns. Well, I'm glad that, that that gives you all hope because whenever I convene you all and the other um, health commissioners on our monthly or twice a month calls, I literally hang up and I walk downstairs to my husband and I tell him how depressed I am. <laughs> <laughs> all of the challenges you all are facing every day. Um, so I will try not to be the Debbie Downer, but thank you. This has been a great conversation. Um, really appreciate it. So this, I think, is the sixth in our series of ongoing discussions with um, different BCHC members. We have another one next week um, where we'll uh, hear from the commissioners of Chicago, the city of Chicago and the city of Minneapolis. Uh, and then later in September, um, San Antonio and um, Charlotte-Mecklenburg County 
those two health directors are old friends, so that'll probably be fun too. There'll be a little bit of chatter. Um, so the also, just so folks know, the recordings of um, all of the previous webinars are on our website. You can sign up to register for them, um, and our contact info was there and then disappeared. But you can look at our website. Um, happy to, to answer questions um, as we can. So again, thank you both, Marcy, Mashiko. It was great to chat with you. Um, thanks, everybody, for, for tuning in. Um, have a great afternoon. Thanks. Bye, you guys. Bye. Bye.